I will go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, let's go ahead and take roll call. Michael Einemensch, I'm here. John Frazier. Present. Lizzie Fitzsimmons. Here. Stratus Gianc, oh no, Brenda Shetty. I need to change this. Yeah, hi everybody. My name is Brenda Shetty and I'm a program manager at the Office of Sustainability and the Environment and I'm stepping in for Stratus Giancoros from the commission. No one can step in for Stratus. <laughs> That's true, <laughs> big shoes. <laughs> Jamie Gade. Present. Ben Grimm. Here. Matt Krieger. Here. Jesse Luckband. Is he online yet? Not yet. Michelle Still Silman. Here. Gabe Sturdivant. Present. And are there no members of the um, <laughs> staff members? Let's go with staff members. I always <laughs> jump to public comment. Daniel Bissell. Okay, yeah. Sarah Gardner. Okay. And let's move to the approval of the minutes. We're going to approve the February 6 minutes, um, which were included in today's packet. Are there any corrections? If none, I would love to have a motion to approve the minutes. I move to approve the minutes. This is Krieger. Second, Grim. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, minutes approved. Now we can go to public comment, and there's no one here from the public. So <laughs> let's move on to our announcements and I'll just a reminder to commissioners if you have any comments please speak into the microphone and say your name so it make it easier for the note takers all right so for the two actionable items from the previous meeting the first was to share with you all the list of CBOs that was was drawn from the equity report which we did um, thanks to those of you who responded uh, letting us know which of these groups you may have connections with for those of you who have not had a chance to do so yet it is not too late I will not start naming names for who I haven't heard from until at least the next meeting. <laughs> so feel free to email me back, um, and if you'd like, I'm happy to send a little reminder on that front. And then the other actionable item was sharing the Habitat for Humanity video that was created. I wasn't able to do that prior to this meeting, um, in part because it was just posted to our uh, YouTube page 14 hours ago. But I did bring it today. Um, and we'll share it uh, when Danny gives us an update on the climate action grant since it's related. Um, then in terms of upcoming events, one of these obviously isn't upcoming, and that's the first one, the ICAR Green Designation Training for Realtors. I know we've been discussing this much in recent months. We wanted to include it on the list of month events for this month just so we could give you a little update. Um, I will say that um, from our perspective, that training went fantastically well. We had nearly 40 people in the room both days. The realtors were very engaged and asked lots of great questions. I I said to Megan, who attended along with myself, that we could not have set up a better focus group if we had wanted to, to better understand how realtors think about energy efficiency in homes and solar on rooftops and how we can better engage with them and what next steps are. Um, the trainer uh, herself told us that normally when she conducts these trainings, a large group is seven to eight people. So the fact that we had nearly 40 just blew her mind, which was really wonderful. Um, and she also told me after the end of the training that um, a sustainability person from uh, South Bend, Indiana had reached out to her and said, hey, I heard you're doing this training in Iowa City and we would really love to do something similar and wanted to talk to her about bringing her in. So um, I know we sometimes talk about Iowa City trying to act as a leader in climate action. Uh, the trainer told me she has never partnered with a city before on a training like this and now she's heard from a second city 
wanting to do it. So she was very enthusiastic about picking my brain about other cities that she could connect with as well. And then I will say on our return to the office, um, we received invites already from uh, realtors to come and talk to individual offices to share more information about what we do, which is great. And Danny also received uh, applications to the insulation grant program that we talked up in it from people whose realtors left the training, went home and referred clients to it. So across the board, it felt uh, like a really great day. And I will say, we went out to celebrate afterwards and maybe the cherry on top, I got carded. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know that Jesse Leckband has joined the meeting. <laughs> Yeah, so great day all around. Matt, you said you knew someone who attended. Did you have any comments you wanted to add? or No, they just thought it was a very positive experience and that they couldn't understand why they hadn't gone through this before until now. Um, so that was good. And so congratulations on a, on a great uh, program. That's a lot of work up to this point has really been a good success. We're very excited about it. Um, and the trainer confirmed that uh, when our MLS listings are updated, they're not quite yet, like all software launches, there's been a slight delay, but when um, that our MLS lists are updated with the green fields, we will be the first city in the Midwest to have done so. So there again, we're showing some leadership, which is really nice. So then the other upcoming events, um, we've got the annual Earth Expo. We wanted to put that on your calendar early because we will be meeting after that one occurs next month, but it is scheduled for April 2nd, um, along with a whole host of Green Iowa AmeriCorps events. They organize that event for us each year, and then when spring comes, they start doing increasing um, levels of education and outreach. So I encourage you to go to the website listed in the agenda to learn more about events they're doing. Um, maybe you'll want to sign up for one of their bird walks or wildflower identification or they actually have a really great book club discussion coming up about the grid so if that's something you're interested in learning more about it's a nice opportunity as well um, and then the Neighborhood Energy Blitz. This one's looking a little further out as well. We have it scheduled for April 22nd. Um, Earth Day as per usual and last year Claire de Guerra uh, attended. We would love it if Climate Action Commission members would also like to attend this year. There are both morning and afternoon slots and it's about a two to two and a half hour commitment for either of those slots. So if you're at all interested, the sign up is live now. Um, it was included in the sustainability newsletter but if you'd like it emailed to you directly, let me know and I'm happy to send that your way. And then we have the Native Plant Symposium. This one, of course, you heard about last month, but we wanted to include it one more time just because uh, slots for that are almost entirely full. So if anybody had an interest in attending, this is just a little reminder to go ahead and get signed up sooner rather than later. Sarah, is there a um, neighborhood for the energy blitz? Like, do you normally focus, you focus in one neighborhood, right? Yes, so um, this year we're going to be focusing on the Creekside neighborhood, which is just east of um, Longfellow. And then we're um, doing a little bit to the north of that. So we're carving out a section of another uh, neighborhood. And it'll be kind of interesting. In the past years, we've done neighborhoods where there was an active neighborhood association. Um, this is the first year we're doing that without, but we feel like we've got a pretty robust um, way of reaching out to residents at this point, and we're uh, working now with Eamon Sharif, who is both a former climate ambassador and now works in our communications department on neighborhood outreach to bring a little extra oomph to our efforts. Um, and he, I know, is hoping that this will spur the development of a, a neighborhood association. So we'll, we'll see lots of nice opportunities there. Um, the next item on the agenda, there's not a huge amount to discuss. Uh, I was asked to prepare a memo to send to City Council just outlining um, where we're at with our insulation grant program. And I wanted to be sure to put it in the agenda packet so that you all are aware of what kind of uh, correspondence is going on between us and City Council as well so that everybody's on the same page. Um, there's not going to be anything in that memo that you haven't already heard in our meetings, but um, Danny did receive a really interesting email last week in response to the insulation grant program from one of the participants. So I thought I'd ask him uh, to just share a little synopsis of it because it's fun to hear. Yeah, so I, um, like Sarah said, I um, 
heard from a homeowner who recently participated in the insulation grant uh, program, and I wanted to share his com their comments um, uh, with you all. Um, first of all, first, first of all, he, um, they mentioned that um, they had no idea how their words grossly underinsulated their home was. Um, now their home maintains an even heat distribution, and the furnace even cycles off. Before, they were used to the furnace running constantly. Um, and they mentioned that the, they were shocked that the furnace would cycle on, off and on, um, even when there were single digit temperatures outside. Um, and when it was really cold before, um, their home uh, would not uh, get out of the 50s. So um, uh, we're seeing, uh, um, in this case in particular, uh, an amazing um, energy savings and um, improved comfort. So we're really happy about that. I think it's the first email our office has ever received that included the phrase, holy Moses. So <laughs> it's very pleased. <laughs> All right, and then the next item on the agenda is just an update from our Resilience Hub Prioritization Group. Um, would anybody from that group like to give us a little update? I can do it. I can do it. You can go ahead. <laughs> um, well, we wanted to let you know our overall goal of our working group is to get to a pilot launch of a Resilience Hub, have a partner organization and launch a, a Resilience Hub pilot. Um, so far, we have identified potential community partners. Um, we've also worked to distinguish what we mean by a Resilience Hub versus an emergency shelter. And uh, the next part that we are starting to work on is really fleshing out what will be a part of the agreement between the city and the potential working or Resilience Hub um, so that we know if Someone's, if we say, this is a resilience hub, this is what we mean by it, this is what we, the city, will offer, and this is what we expect in return from that agreement. I missed anything? Uh, I think the only thing, this is Graham, the only thing I would add is we've started kind of coordinating with uh, Johnson County Public Health, right, Was who attended this last meeting um, in there, as well as uh, talked about coordinating with Johnson County Emergency Management. Thanks so much for that update. And on, on to unfinished and ongoing business. Just, just one other quick question. What is the? Just remind me what the overall timing is that you that you're thinking of right now. I know it's probably kind of fluid. I'm guessing, but I just wondered. For the launch. For the work of the working group, yeah. We're imagining like another couple meetings to kind of okay. flesh out the end of. Um, the, our work with what the agreement should be, but in terms. Sarah, when are you thinking we can get to official launch? We'd really like to have it launched by the end of this calendar year. We've got money in the budget for it in the next fiscal year budget, which starts in July. I know it can get confusing. Um, but we've been in conversation with an organization in the community already that we think is a good candidate for the pilot. So once um, we get the sort of rough parameters worked out, we'll go to that group and see if it works from them. And then we'll have, it'll sort of feel like a soft launch is I think what we're envisioning because there are just so many, so many unknowns in it really. Um, we did have a presentation from our library, um, which is looking to join a resilience hub network that seems to serve primarily libraries. So they're sort of going to be running a parallel effort. Um, and that'll be really nice because we can compare what they're getting and doing with what we're envisioning and thinking about how to sync it up. Um, one of the things we talked about was the possibility of instead of trying to reinvent the wheel ourselves, maybe just encouraging folks to sign up with that network and then we would come in with some financial funding and uh, additional resources to help make it easy to participate in that network. It seems to me like our sense is we still kind of want to do our own thing is where we're leaning. Um, so that just takes a bit more work, but I th think we're pretty close actually to being able to letting that working group take a break <laughs> and uh, let staff hit the bricks to get it happening. So, yeah. We've also talked, even after we we um, get a, a hub launched, is there, like, what will be the, the next step of the conversation around resilience and resilience thinking and 
will we want to continue that conversation in other ways? Um, are there any other questions about Resilience Hub Working Group or what it is? I mean, we have newer members too, so if you have any questions about what it is we're working on or why. A general overview would be great. Thanks. Yeah. Like uh, right now. Of what you're, yeah, yeah if, if that's okay. Yeah. If anyone, Matt or Ben, do you guys want to share a general overview? general overview of what a resilience hub is or what we're doing with it yeah, yeah what you're looking to do here in yeah so I guess it's part of the overall you know adaptation plan knowing that you know uh, even if we do the best that we possibly can and we mitigate as much as we can we're still gonna have to adapt to uh, a different climate so uh, the the idea of resilience hubs is to kind of build up uh, communities to you know weather some of the storms that we're going to experience and some of the you know outcomes of you know having hotter weather and colder weather, uh, and just making sure there's a place that community members can gather and get the resources and the support that they need. And the idea of a resilience hub is that you, you know, we're not starting from scratch, we're looking at uh, community-based organizations that are already doing some of these things and have some of the capabilities that we're looking for. And, you know, from the city's perspective, identifying the, uh, you know, where they're stronger and where uh, their weaker points are and supporting them and building them up so that they can really function as a resilience hub. Uh, did I capture that? <laughs> Is there anything that else that you two would add? No, I, I think um, the other thing somewhere in reading in that is, you know, in an emergency type situation, you got your first responders who are going to deal with real emergencies. And this is kind of taking care of some of those soft uh, topics, you know, whether it's solar to recharge cell phones or, um, uh, you know, places where you can relay information and communicate information out to the community. It's kind of those kind of topics that are less emergency oriented. So, yeah, we, when we talk about the difference between a resilience hub and an emergency shelter, we are thinking of what are the trusted organizations in our community that we can partner with where people might go to get information or recharging but then they go home they shelter at home um, versus when yeah you really need a place to go and sleep okay thank you very well put yeah I, excellent yeah i think that's the big distinction i think that we worked on early on is the difference between a resilience hub and an emergency shelter and the resilience hub is really there to enable you to shelter in place and it's also meant to be more human focused than hazard focused so um it's sort of a shift of perspective but i feel like we've had very interesting conversations around it um and brenda or anyone else um I'm happy to share the link to the USDN Resilience Hub website that we've been looking at. Um, in particular, there's a page we looked at that had like five basic criteria of a Resilience Hub and we used that when we were looking at different uh, organizations we might partner with to try to get a gut sense of where everybody was and what we might need to offer to get them up to a Resilience Hub status. So um, let me note that down. I'll share that out. If Would everybody like to receive it? Okay. Any other questions, comments? Thanks for that question, Brenda. I think that was helpful. Okay, moving on to new or unfinished business, ongoing business, unfinished and ongoing business. <laughs> um, so this is where I'll pop in and share that video that we mentioned, and then we'll let Danny um, give just a quick update on the climate action grant process for this year, and hopefully get a couple volunteers. At Iowa Valley Habitat for Humanity, we build and finance affordable houses for low-income homeowners. We've been working on this project through the pandemic for a couple of years, and this will be home to a nine-person household. We secured a climate action grant through the city of Iowa City so that we can make the home a little bit more energy efficient. So we use the grant to install an air source heat pump and a heat pump water heater. 
Over 40% of a household's energy budget goes to heating the home. Using an electric heat pump can reduce their emissions, reduce their energy use, and reduce their utility bills. Additionally, over 20% of a household's energy use goes to heating their hot water for showers, dishwashing, those kinds of activities. So using an efficient heat pump water heater can greatly reduce those costs and that energy use. Affordable housing isn't just about having an affordable mortgage and low property taxes. It's also about making sure that the house is easy to maintain and affordable to maintain. And so the initiatives that we've taken on through this climate action grant will allow the family to keep their utility bills low and then they'll be able to use that money to invest in their future, to pay for reliable transportation, to provide for some of their other necessities that they need. For anybody who is interested in applying for a climate action grant, I would highly recommend contacting city staff. They'll answer your questions and walk you through the process. Make it as easy as possible on you. All right, so now you've seen the video. Danny, you want to give us an update? Sure. Um, so I, I know we went over this a little bit last um, month, but I'll um, just mention again that climate action grants are available to um, for-profit businesses and nonprofit entities and students um, um, up to ten thousand uh, dollars to advance a project um, that they um, that they wouldn't otherwise be able to complete uh, without these funds. Um, um, advancing one of the uh, pillars of our um, uh, climate action and adaptation plan. Um, the applications just went live this morning, and the um, application period will be open until noon on um, April 17th, um, after which time we'll need um, a committee uh, made up of city staff and uh, two of you um, to um, go through those applications and score them. Um, it's an easy process, pretty straightforward, using a scoring rubric that we've already developed. So um, it's um, nothing too difficult, but uh, we'd like to ask um, now for two volunteers uh, to um, help with that review committee. I'd be happy to help. Thank Mr. you, Matt. Walter, for the minutes. Uh, I'd do it, uh, Fitzsimmons. All right, thank you both. And um, that doesn't um, leave the rest of you off the hook. Uh, we'd also <laughs> like your help in um, uh, advertising uh, these grants. Um, we, we do know that you've been working with um, uh, CBOs and other groups. Um, so we'd ask that you please pass along um, this information to any groups or CBOs that you've been working with. Um, and then if you do so, let me know um, which groups those are so I can um, be aware of, of um, of, of that, and um, that could help with my um, direct outreach as well. So, thank you all. I do have one question, Gade. Yeah. Um, I am wondering if you have a good like social media post to share or some type of graphic that we could share with I, it if we I did believe, want to post. Yeah, I believe we do. I can find that and get that sent to you. Great, thank you. I have a question to um, yeah. Shetty here. Um, I was wondering about student projects that uh, do you have any examples of what students have done in the past or so the most recent example would be at um, Horace Mann Elementary they did a community garden project on um, school grounds um, and made those um, uh, vegetables available to the to the community yep interesting thanks any questions about climate action grants all right, on to the inventory. So hopefully you all got my email and no one printed out this report, which looks beautiful but does use a lot of ink. Um, we are going to be giving an update to the city council later this month about progress that's been made uh, with the climate action efforts essentially since the passage of the climate action plan um, and so we wanted to share that report with you all as well it's really a, it's material you've heard in other ways over the years with our meetings but it's always nice to have it repackaged and in this case we wanted to really pull out some key points so that um, com commission members as well as council members as you're going out into the community and being asked well 
what is going on, you've got some clear talking points to draw on. Um, and also, we hope that the report makes some connections um, between the thinking behind why we do what we do. Um, and we can dig into that a little. So. I did bring a copy of the, well, I, I pulled up a PDF of the report on screen and realized it was not going to show well. So if you'll forgive me, what you're going to see actually is an early draft of the slide deck that we're putting together to go along with it. Um, it won't have all of the information necessarily yet that's in the report, but I think we'll have some key highlights. Um, and we just wanted to use a good chunk of the meeting to go through that and make sure you're all comfortable with the information. Um, so. I will just ask, how would you like to proceed? Would you like me to run through the slide deck so you can see the different graphs and we can talk about them a little? Or did you come with specific questions and you'd rather just start there and I can pull up the relevant graphs as we go through? Uh -huh. Do you have highlights that you'd specifically like us to be aware of? Well, it's all near and dear to my heart, John. <laughs> Your question, which, which page is important? They're, they're all important. Yeah. But if you had limited time, do you have any that really you want us to be aware of? Why don't we run through the deck? Because I imagine it's going to be situational, right? Like if you're talking to a business, one slide might seem more relevant than another. Um, but And if, I, if we're going through, if I see any of that, I'm like, you really need to hammer this home, I'll call it out. Just real quick, Matt, were you going to say something? I was going to recommend that because I, okay. I had <laughs> specific questions on different pages. So, yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, so as you know, it begins with a look at the inventory from this year and just a reiteration of the goals that Iowa City has set for itself. Since the adoption of the plan, we do have new council members who may not be entirely familiar with those goals. Specifically, the we are aiming for a 45% reduction of emissions by 2030, and we want to get to net zero by 2050. Our um, Greenhouse gas inventories that Danny works so very hard on every year to pull together show the kind of progress that's being made, as you all are aware from our discussion with the one sheet that we put out at the end of the year and will continue to put out at the end of every year. Um, we achieved that 2030 goal a little early in 2020, and then in 2021, it crept back up. And that's not hugely surprising. That's a lot of the impact we're seeing from the pandemic, right? Um, and as you get further into the report, you can see that, oh, geez, touchy mouse. Um, as you get further on, you can see specifically where we saw those um, emissions go back up. So very specifically, we can see a little bump back up in transportation. We can see um, a pretty big gain back in industrial buildings, and that's not so surprising either as manufacturing ramped back up. I will say the one that caught us a little su by surprise was residential buildings, the growth in energy usage there. Um, Part of that may be weather related. We don't know entirely what happened there, but um, we always are very mindful of that as we're thinking about our programs and interventions. And in fact, in um, the coming months with this group, we're going to be talking about the energy benchmarking that's called for in the Climate Action Plan. So being aware of how the emissions are performing in those three building sectors, commercial and industrial in particular, and then residential, um, will, I think, be important for that discussion. And then, of course, we always like to point out that buildings and energy, well, I don't know if likes the right word, but we often point out that buildings and energy account for, by and large, the lion's share of emissions generated here in Iowa City. And the reason we call that out so often, this is one of our big talking points, John, is that when we talk to folks about what they're doing for climate action, um, the first thing people want to talk about is recycling, right? And so we're quick to point out that recycling really only accounts, or waste more specifically, really only accounts for 3% of our emissions. Almost all of that is driven by organic material in the landfill. And so recycling is important and there are good reasons to do it, but when we're talking about climate action, we want to be thinking a little bigger. A quick, Sarah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm used to looking at like the school district, which is multiple cities, but um, did that increase have anything to do with the Dwayne Arnold plant shutting down? Because you could actually argue that that was part of what we saw within the school district is we actually went down and then saw a bump back up because they had less pure energy. Do you know at that level? Interesting. Um, Dwayne Arnold feeds Alliance territory, so we wouldn't necessarily have seen so much of an impact here. Um, in residential, in particular, 
a lot of those emissions are driven by um, natural gas, or as, we've, as you'll see in this report, we've started referring to it as fossil gas. So I don't know, but that's a good question to investigate. Danny, do you have any sense of that? Um, when, when doing our inventory, um, we look at the null um, energy emissions, which is the average of the um, of uh, what is fed to us from the grid. And I noticed it did creep back up a little bit, but um, I don't know what would account for that. It, is it be, maybe because of the mix over the average of the year? Are we not getting the the kind of the maybe the wind powered was down for that year or something? I don't know if. Um, yeah, I, I don't know of an easy way to suss out um, the specifics. Yeah, actually, wind power grew by five percent in the year, and that's one of the other big talking points yeah. we have in here. Oh, Jesse, feel free to weigh in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, I think wind was somewhat of a down year, and I mean it grew, but there was less production, I think, than hoped for in twenty twenty one. But I, I believe it rebounded in. Um, 2022, but yeah, I mean, our as far as the like carbon intensity or the you know our retirement of um, of renewable of the carbon credits basically for customers um, that shouldn't impact that shouldn't be impacted by Dwayne Arnold generally just because that's not part of our our grid. I mean, it's all in the bulk retail you know bulk um, electric system, but it's not generally counted and wouldn't be counted in our carbon intensity mix. I will say one of the talking points that we've had out of this is that it really underscores the importance of energy efficiency and our all of the above strategy that even in a year where you have growth of wind production, you could still have emissions going up speaks to the fact that we can't rely solely on efforts made by MidAmerican to achieve these goals, that there are many other things we need to be doing as well. And I'd say that would be the big talking point to take away from that particular growth. Cool. Um, I know I tend to roll through these, so do hop in at any point if you have questions. Um, what's the yellow on this? I'm sure it was addressed on the previous, but... It was um, yellow, it, so those are by years. So okay. yellow is 2021, and then the kind of grayish one would be 2020, orange is 2019, and blue is 2018. Okay. Thank you for catching that. We'll have to add those years back in. <laughs> this is Krieger again. I think I maybe it was on the year end report rather than, I know this is probably your you know the first take look at it, but um, when we looked at the year over year, we were able to see kind of the percentage increase or decrease within each of those. I think that might just be helpful rather than seeing just the bar graph, mm -hmm. um, just sort of a, at a glance, understand it. Cool, oh, thanks. I'm gonna note that down, Matt. Yeah, and obviously we're still cleaning up these slides, so we appreciate that feedback very much. Um, all right, the other thing, um, and this was a big point of this particular uh, report and is worth mentioning here, is that this report also makes the argument for thinking more broadly about ways to track our progress beyond just looking at the greenhouse gas emissions. And I think one of the great lines actually in it was that um, a greenhouse gas emission inventory makes a better compass than speedometer. And the reason for that is that um, what we're seeing, not just in Iowa City, but in uh, cities across the US that do this kind of activity, is that greenhouse gas emission inventories do a really great job of capturing right away things that impact every household, right? So the increase of wind energy, for example, um, tends to get reflected very well because every household participates in it, whereas our efforts to increase insulation in individual homes make a very big difference and an important one to the residents participating in it. But we're going to have to do that year over year over year before we actually start seeing it in the inventory because it's such a big data set. And so one of the other things this report does, and this is really what the rest of the report and slides are, is looking at what are some of those other indicators we could be paying attention to to say, you know, we're acting in good faith and trying to do the things that we said we would do in the plan. 
Um, the next slide, we often uh, find this very interesting internally. We don't talk about it as much externally, and that just it takes a closer look at what are those emission sources in the three building sectors, residential, commercial, and industrial. And the thing I point out in these slides is that when you look at residential, it's fossil gas that's contributing a bit more than half, and then electricity is a little less than half. And for this reason, we emphasize both energy efficiency and electrification in our programs. So we, our insulation grant program addresses energy efficiency. We also have the heat pump program to be looking at electrification. Um, when you look at industrial, it's a very different picture, right? It's almost overwhelmingly electricity and a smaller amount, segment of that is accounted for by fossil gas. And so when you look at our TIF-funded energy program that matches dollar for dollar up to $250,000 what industrial entities um, and commercial entities in the city are doing, there's a much heavier emphasis on energy efficiency there um, paired with dollars for solar installation because we know that it's the electricity emissions that we really need to address. Ultimately, we need to do both for both, but if we're thinking strategically now in the early days, those are the key messages we see flowing out of that. And then, um, of course, you have the graph from Mid-American uh, here that shows that growth in wind energy over the same period of time, uh, just what Jesse was talking about. This is Krieger again. I was wondering, do you, do you know um, how the mix has changed in each of those sectors? Yes, we do. Okay. I mean, is it? Not much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then on the next page, we talk about the tons per capita. For the last several years, we've been asked to report to the city council what the um, total greenhouse gas emissions are per capita, per, uh, which is to say per resident in Iowa City. And we decided this year to try to break them down a little more to look at what was, um, what are the emission tons per capita for the residential? So what is it for housing for each person? What is it for transportation for each person? Um, partly because we were interested in seeing those numbers ourselves to figure out um, if there's another way we could be strategizing meeting those needs, but also because to meet the goal set in the IPCC report, which you know our climate action plan, that's where we get our net zero goals from, um, we know that we need to get down to two tons per capita for every person total, right? And so right now you can see, um, starting in 2018, we had 2.9 tons um, per capita just for housing alone. And we've been able to bring that number down a little. Now we're at 2.3. So we're closer to two than we were to three in housing. But of course, we need to be getting even lower than that, um, obviously, to get all the way down to where we need to be. And then we also talk a little about you know how this gets paired with our energy efficiency and electrification spending. So, sorry, this is Craig again. So are you saying that also that um, because on the earlier graph, it was showing an increase in the overall residential market, but the per capita is decreasing. So that means as we're increasing residents, we're not necessarily on the same rate increasing usage. Um, Greenhouse gas usage, it's fossil. I might ask you to ask the question one more time to make well, sure I understand. One of the lingering questions in the back of my mind was, are we, you know, what is the rate of increase of residents as well? You know, mm -hmm. like new homes being built or um, number of people moving here, whatever it may be. But because our overall grid, the wind energy has been increasing, I wondered what was the, what you know, was there a correlation there? It, based on this, it's telling me that even with an increase potentially in residents, we're still decreasing overall on a per capita basis. Per capita, yeah. Yes, and I would say um, part of, and this was such a struggle with this particular report, part of what we're seeing here too is a difference in time frame, right? So from 2018 to 2021, overall, they went down. Even though they crept a little back up in 2021, it's still lower than where we were in 2018. So overall, the trend is still downward. And we talk about that in report too, that normally you see fluctuations, and for that reason, it's often better to look at a five-year time frame than a one-year time frame. Um, on average, we have something fewer than 100 housing starts uh, per year in Iowa City, so our population is growing. It's not growing hugely. 
Um, but if you think about that, that's 400 more homes within this four-year time frame, and we're still coming down, so that's good. Um, I could say something here about the overall efficiency of newer homes than older homes, but we'll save that for the discussion when the Historic Preservation Commission wants to talk with all of us. I think there's some alignment we need, may need to work on there. and I don't want to step on any toes before we have that conversation. This is Ian and Lynch. I was just wondering if this is, you know, we're at 2.3 tons per capita just in housing. Do we know what we're at per capita? Total? Total. We do. Um, it's, uh, gosh, what was it in our last report? I cannot remember off the top of my head. <laughs> I want to say nine something, between nine and ten. And I need feel to like it might be a little lower than that, but we can double check on it. Thank you for asking just if we know it and not what the number is. <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be my next question, <laughs> but I can refrain. Um, we, do, we actually do have to report on that every year to the city council, so we can get the number pretty easily. Because that's, like if we're on nine, we need to get to two. That's, that's we got some work to do. <laughs> but we also have, I mean... The other thing you'll find in this report, and we put it on the first page for a good reason, is that it can feel overwhelming, being like, we're at n nearly nine, we need to get to two, like, we gotta get on it. Um, but if you look at the projections, what we need is a 2% reduction year over year between now and 2050. If we can do it faster than that, and we certainly are at the moment, that's great. But whenever I feel like panicking, I just sort of remind myself, 2% year over year, we're gonna get there. All right, um, and then a couple other numbers we're suggesting are go good to look at is both the total number of energy audits received by Iowa City households, and of course this is the service that's performed by our Green Iowa AmeriCorps team. Incidentally, in the realtor training that we hosted last week, uh, we brought in the Green Iowa AmeriCorps team to do a demonstration, and um, the trainer just could not believe that this was a service that we offer for free in Iowa City. Um, she talked about how, generally speaking, to get a BPI certified contractor to come in and do this work, and all of our team is BPI certified, um, would cost a household 400 to $700, and we do it for free for Iowa City residents. So we like seeing that number go up year after year. Um, and then on the other side, you have total energy kits delivered to Iowa City households. And of course, this is the impact of our uh, neighborhood energy blitzes, by and large, that you're seeing. The Green Iowa AmeriCorps team did also deliver some energy kits themselves in 2020 when it was uh, difficult to get into homes to do audits. Um, they have circled back and are now offering audits to those households as well. Um, but you can see between the two, we're um, actually reaching a, a sizable portion of the city to get some information out about the value of energy efficiency and steps individual households can take. Ooh. And remind me, that graph is cumulative, cumulative. not each year. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Otherwise, it'd be a real boring graph. <laughs> 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 Um, in the report, we also talk about climate action grant projects, which thanks to Danny's update, you know fairly well about how the program works. One of the uh, metrics that we've been looking at internally and we propose looking at externally in this report is just how those climate action grants break down in terms of their relationship with the emissions profile that we have and our goals um, related to the climate action plan. In the first year of the climate action grant projects, if you go back and look at what is funded or what was funded, overwhelmingly they fell into the sustainable lifestyle category. Um, as we've matured that program, one of the things that our two volunteers will see in our rubric is we ask to take a look at how does this correspond to the climate action plan and try to give higher priority to the higher priority needs. And as a result of that, we're seeing more and more of these grants go to things like um, buildings and energy. Transportation actually feels roughly proportional to where it needs to be. We could do a little bit more transportation, but we'd be very happy to continue to get more building and energy funded uh, or related projects funded by these grants. And then, of course, you all know from our report, so I won't read down the list, um, we included uh, the, all the different types of projects that have been funded just in the last two years, and you can see how wide-ranging they are, um, which is always really exciting for me to see them listed out that way. 
Similarly, we offer a list of projects that have been funded through our com commercial and industrial matching grant projects. Um, here, when we talk with you, we refer to them as the TIF-funded projects because we've talked about them so much. Hopefully, you all know what a TIF-funded project is. Um, but for because this is an outward-facing report as well, we thought we'd make it clear that TIF means commercial and industrial. Um, and you can see we have this nice quote even from Adamantine Spine about what a difference it made to them to get solar panels on top of their business. We realized, I will say, um, as you know, we've had some sometimes less than comfortable conversations about uh, the need for Iowa City to be forwarding solar projects. Um, in, in these commission meetings. And one of the things we've realized from that is the difficulty with funding rooftop solar is that nobody sees it, right? Like if you drive past Adamantine Spine, you don't know that the city paid to put solar panels on the roof of that warehouse um, just visually. So we want to be sure that we're raising the profile of those kinds of projects that we've been working on. And we have two in the pipeline for this year, so very exciting. Um, transportation, here you can see the per capita number for it is 2.2, um, or 2.02, so we're a little closer to our two goal there even. Um, and then vehicle miles traveled, again, we track the vehicle miles traveled just within the city limits in these reports and in our greenhouse gas emissions um, profile. Oh, that was lovely. It made it feel magical about just doing it within <laughs> Iowa City. <laughs> Um, but as you'll see, within Iowa City, um, the majority of drivers continue to drive on their own in a vehicle. Um, and drove alone is put in there um, to draw a distinction between it and carpooling. Um, worked from home is a surprisingly large piece of the pie, I thought, on it. Um, one of the things we talk about in the report is just that uh, Iowa City residents already bike and walk at a higher rate than the national average, um, much higher actually, about five to seven times the rate. Um, and so here too, when we think about how do we advance our goals, um, it's important to continue thinking in an all of the above strategy. And certainly when we're out in the community, we talk about that a lot. That. Um, rather than say you need to give up your car and like bike to work from here on out, um, we say have you thought about biking one day a week or walking one day a week or getting on the bus one day a week or carpooling one day a week and then growing from there, right? Because a lot of times what we hear from residents is that it's just really intimidating to think about making that giant leap. But if you can start building some flexibility and um, really choosing all these from among all these different modes of transportation, that's going to get us further faster than just getting a few early adopters to do the absolute best that they can. Um, we also talk about transit ridership and how that was impacted by the pandemic. As you can see, we had a big drop off in 2020. That's not so surprising. Um, we've had a slow recovery. In other areas, people have uh, we've seen sort of a full return to activity to pre-pandemic levels, not so with transit ridership. So that is a tough nut that we're going to have to continue working on. As you may recall, the Climate Action Plan calls for us to double our transit ridership, um, and that is double from 2018 notes. So what it really means at this point is meaning tripling where we're at now. This is Einan Lynch. Um, Sarah, do you have any sense, like, those people who used to ride and then stopped riding, do we know, like, and now 10% more people work from home than they used to, so they didn't come back to ride, or did those people stop riding the bus and now they drive? Um, it's tricky. We don't, we don't have quite the granular data to be able to say. Um, I will say it's a national problem that you're seeing, like transit systems everywhere are really hurting from the impacts of the pandemic. Um, a lot of what seems to be as much, a lot of what seems to have happened is more car ownership and driving individually. Like, did our drive alone is fifty nine percent a bigger number than it used to be? Like from twenty eighteen. Yeah, yeah, we should look into that. Yeah, I don't know, but we can find out. Because I was going to ask yeah. the question, what was the percentage in twenty eighteen for working from home? Yeah, I, just, yeah. <laughs> I got to a really long way around yeah, that. The way I, went. Yeah. <laughs> I will say, um, it's it. So these numbers are just a little tricky because they're done. Yeah. 
here too, we're suffering from like different time frames depending on who collects what data, right? And this data is collected by, for us by the DOT, which uses some estimates on off years. Um, what I can say is that the increase of people working from home has largely been a coastal phenomenon. What we see more in the interior of the U.S. is that there are some more people working from home, but it's not as big as what you've seen in the coastal areas. Um, and we don't have any reason to believe that that wouldn't be true for Iowa City as well. Except for the ACT campus, which apparently had a lot of folks who drove in, um, and now they are all by and large working remotely. Unfortunately, a lot of them were driving in from other cities, so they don't really show up in our uh, greenhouse gas inventory except for the little segment when they hit Iowa City city limits and go to ACT campus, which is like a mile. <laughs> so, uh, interesting, very very thoughtful question. This is Sturdivant. Does the transit include like CAN bus? No, this is Iowa City transit data Just Iowa only. City. Okay. Yep. One of the things that the city council will be taking up this year is um, looking at ways to get to essentially waiving bus fare. Um, it's a question, you know, it's a tough question because we're also facing a tighter budget year. Um, but one of the reasons we wanted to include this information in particular is one, we don't want to hide from the bad news, right? We want to face it on. We don't want to paint too rosy a picture about um, where we're at, but also you know, it's an important to consider like how are we going to triple bus ridership from where we're at now? Making fare free may be one of the levers we have to pull. So we'll uh, certainly be paying attention to that debate as it rolls forward. Um, as you know, the number of electric vehicles in the city fleet has grown year over year. We, um, thanks to the work of this commission, the city has an EV first purchase policy for all our light duty vehicles. So on this graph, you can see the cumulative number of, pardon me, EVs in the city fleet. Uh, four of those are our buses, and then the rest are the light duty vehicles. And um, they are proving very popular among staff, um, both in the sense that um, we have more departments and divisions looking and requesting EVs. So on top of, you know, what is just our standing policy that we're going to look at EVs first, we have departments saying, yes, please, we would really like this. And also we're seeing city employees um, purchasing EVs for their own usage, which is also something you typically see in workplaces that have electric vehicles. The, uh, people who get to drive them every day for work end up really loving them and wanting to drive them for home as well. So... Very exciting stuff. And we often talk about what great ambassadors those electric buses have been for community members. You know, the number of questions we get about EVs following the rollout of those buses just increased dramatically. And I think it's because once you see a bus going down the street, you um, suddenly become a lot less concerned about whether or not your car is going to have the capacity to get you where you need to go. So then we just have um, a few other EV related slides on here. You can see um, this is one of Danny's favorite things actually to track the number of unique EV users at our public charging stations, which you can see also took a dip during the pandemic when people weren't going to work and now has climbed back up as people are working more and traveling more um, outside of the home. And this is, a, I will say, one of the things that makes us think that um, the number of folks working at home hasn't increased as dramatically as the number of people driving, because we just see more driving behavior overall. Um, and then we also put up the map of um, all the public charging stations, not just within our own parking ramps, but within the community at large. So at gas stations and dealerships. And you can see um, that the green ones on this particular map are level two chargers and the orange are level three or the DC fast chargers. So um, we know that when we go out and talk in the community, people are always very pleasantly surprised to see just how many charging stations there are in Iowa City. And one of the things we talk about in the report is that when we did our EV readiness study for the area, it identified 450 charge points per million people as the target um, to aim for that would cause the sort of 
tipping effect to get more to spur EV adoption. And Iowa City, when you adjust for population, is well above that. Adjusted for population, we have the equivalent of something like 650 charge points per million population. So we're doing quite well there. Sorry, I just had a quick question. That uh, one of the items, this is Krieger again, in the um, uh, report was that uh, there was an example from someone who had, um, who lives, I think maybe in an apartment, but then charges at a neighboring, you know, for every few hours, maybe at a neighboring. I'm guessing it could be in the ramp, it could be somewhere else. Um, I saw that the focus was to focus more on multifamily locations. Are you? Is there also the, still the intention to increase? Um, charging stations within the ramps, parking, public parking areas as well? Um, most of our focus going forward is going to be on getting those charging units into multifamily uh, structures for a couple reasons. Um, one, 80% of charging happens at home. And so if we really want to be increasing EV adoption, then we need to be making it as convenient for renters as it is for homeowners. Um, also, uh, Iowa, as you may recall, uh, passed a statute a few years ago saying starting July of this year, all um, public charging stations need to assess a tax on the electricity dispensed at those charging stations. That tax does not apply to uh, charging at home. And so um, I'm actually quite proud of Iowa City for trying to get out ahead of this issue because ultimately it's an equity issue, right? If we don't put those charging stations at multifamily units, then renters are disproportionately going to bear the burden of that tax. That being said, I know we did apply for and successfully win a VW grant to put in additional charging stations in at least one of our two, two charging stations in at least one of our ramps. So we do have some more coming, but where we're really putting our energy and effort is uh, in the multifamily going forward. And uh, I'm not going to jinx myself. We'll just talk more about that later. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, one one oh comment, yeah. Fraser. Uh, I really appreciate what you just said, and it, it reminds me, and when I was going through this report, kind of a funny thing, maybe you think I'm being silly, but a bank robber was being interviewed and asked why he robbed banks, and the answer was because that's where the money is. And that's what you're doing. You're going to where the money, so to speak, is. And I think that's our focus throughout this report, really. Yes, we need to recycle, but we need to hit this. And yes, we need to get recharging stations all over the place for everyone 24 hours a day, but 80% of the people recharge at night, and et cetera, et cetera. So I applaud you for going to where the money is. And I think that's our biggest challenge. At the same time, you mentioned equity, and I almost raised my hand a while ago because uh, uh, oh, God, there are a lot of it. hidden equity issues. And the more I think about it, the, the more equity issues that, that pop up. And, and I don't want us to get into a situation, I think we're avoiding it nicely, of a regressive sales tax, so to speak, where, where you're getting the poor people to pay for this rather than the wealthy people to pay for it. And I think about insulation. You know, wealthy people can afford to have a well-insulated house because they buy new houses. Poor people can't do that. So equity everywhere. So those two points, I think you're doing a really good focus on going to where the money is and watching out for equity at the same time. I think it's a real tightrope act. Gosh, John, do you want to give the presentation to the city council? <laughs> Thank you so much. Not really. <laughs> You know, the other point on insulation with equity, which we make frequently, is that increasing insulation in homes ultimately is an equity issue, not just because it lowers the cost for that individual household, but it helps keep costs low for all ratepayers in the city, especially as we transition to clean energy sources, right? It costs less to build 100 windmills than it does, or wind turbines, sorry, than it does to build 200. And so as we bring energy usage down, we are helping ensure that our energy costs remain low during that period of transition, which is why we feel very passionately, as passionately as people can, about insulation in Iowa City. 
So, um, and then to your point about recycling and composting, um, we actually have this great um, page in the report where we talk about just the impressive strides that have been made in Iowa City between 2018 and 2021 in terms of recycling activity and organic um, composting, where we've had um, over 50% growth in both. So we're recycling more, we're composting more, and we're still sending more to the landfill than we were in the same period of time, right? And one of the reasons we call that out is to say recycling alone also will not do it. Just as we talk about clean energy resources alone isn't enough, you know, with recycling and composting, those are great. We need to continue doing them, but we also need to reduce consumption overall. And that was very clearly identified as a goal in the climate action plan. This, we feel, just puts some numbers behind why we talk about that and have nifty things organized by community members like the upcoming repair cafes. Yeah, absolutely. I was also going to point out that 25,000 packages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, poor Michael. I told her that I've been riding on the bus, um, which I always feels like a great way to learn so much about the community. But lately, uh, there's been an Amazon warehouse manager who's been riding on my bus route. and. Uh, I have been picking his brain on the ride in about the uh, number of packages bought and delivered here in the city. Uh, we have some work to do. <laughs> we'll just say that. Um, and then you'll see we also um, have the results from the most recent waste characterization study, which is really an audit um, that's per performed by the Department of Natural Resources here in Iowa City. They come in and um, they pull trash, essentially, um, from the trucks going to the landfill and do a random sampling to try to figure out uh, how much is going there. Um, and you'll see, even though we have increased our recycling, 18% uh, of what's getting sent to the landfill is paper, right? 14% uh, is plastic. That may not be as bad as it looks um, compared to paper because there are just a larger number of plastics that cannot be recycled. The paper, certainly, we should be recycling as much as we can. Glass and metal, there are two very small segments. Organics remain nearly a quarter of what we send, so even with our increased composting, there's still more that needs to be done. And I know that um, when Jane comes and talks to you, in addition to talking about um, her efforts to engage restaurants, I hope she'll also talk a bit about um, the grant that our uh, resource management folks have recently applied for to try to dramatically expand our composting facility. Because as you know, we are currently at capacity. So if we wanna get more stuff out of the landfill, we have to grow that composting operation. This is Krieger, quick question on the data. So the data is for the landfill as a whole, mm -hmm. not what's coming from Iowa City. No, I think it is broken down. Is it, well, no. It's what's, what's coming from the county or the other, you know, the. I think it's the landfill. You think it's the landfill? You know, we'll double check with Jen Jordan on that because they're pulling it straight from the trucks. So right. in theory, okay, okay, from the city trucks, they would be able to know which city it's coming from. Although I think. As I'm saying this out loud, Danny's right. I think they characterize it for the county as a whole. Um, the reason I ask is that, um, you know, should we also be, while we are targeting the city, probably um, sources, because there are other, the independent haulers that go there that only offer certain things, like they don't offer composting, right? So then is there a program there or something that we need to provide some focus to? I don't know. Because I wonder if that organics is high just because you're getting, Stuff other from other, cities. Of other sources, yeah. And yeah, other cities and apartment buildings, I would say, probably are contributing. I do know um, one of the unique qualities of our landfill is the city owns it, but it serves the entire county. Um, and for that reason, Jane Wilch, um, in her education and outreach, she's one of the few city employees who actually does work across jurisdictional bound boundaries. So she's working with other cities and um, residents in other locations to deliver the same kind of information that Iowa City is getting about recycling. Uh, opportunities um, but yeah there's more we can do clearly um, this is and Lynch I was if how, how do I say what's my question um, if we still have a corridor coming from organics but we're our composting facility is full as you say we could we could expand that facility but I'm also wondering like is there 
anything we need to think about in sustainable lifestyle. I know you guys talk a lot about just like reducing food waste overall, but like home or neighborhood composting systems or something where we're also just reducing the amount that has to be trucked out of the neighborhood and instead, you know, finding ways to keep that organic waste going back into the community soil. I am so glad you mentioned this, Michael. <laughs> One of the things we're doing is, you might recall in years past, our AmeriCorps team has had a rain barrel um, bulk buy event. Um, we actually have reconfigured that event for this year. Um, instead of uh, handing out rain barrels, which have some impact on stormwater, it's not the biggest intervention you could do, um, we actually have purchased a number of compost bins in bulk to encourage home composting, and we're going to be opening it up to all county residents because all county residents feed into our landfill in hopes that um, providing low-cost compost bins will inspire some folks to do some more home composting as well. Um, and we're also, I would say, internally taking a look again at how we talk about food waste, um, in part trying to make a better distinction between what is food scraps, so eggshells, banana peels, chicken bones, the things that you are not going to eat, right, that really do need to be composted, versus um, surplus food that can be shared out through the community and um, consumed rather than composted. And I want to say that, uh, or point out that we're very deliberately trying to call it surplus food and food scraps, so I'll need to correct this slide. And particularly because of some feedback we um, recently received Actually, not here, but we heard about it from another city where um, an agency similar to Table to Table there said, you know, could we please not call it food waste because then it implies we're feeding waste to the populations we serve and nobody wants to eat that, right, or be at the receiving end of it. And so um, we thought that was a really excellent point and we thought it was a good opportunity to, to adjust some of our messaging around it. And I mention it now because I know you all are community ambassadors as well and probably want to be just as thoughtful as we are in how we talk about that. I recently read about another city uh, that was, they're um, paying residents or, or paying some of the costs of getting backyard chickens as a way of, for like giving the chickens food scraps as a way to reduce overall organics going to the landfill, and then people get the benefit of the eggs, but the city was seeing like backyard chickens as a way of reducing organics. I don't know that we're at a place where we're going to pay people for chickens yet, but I do know, I will say, and I'm encouraged by this, um, our NDS staff is looking at revising our chicken ordinance um, to sort of lower the barrier to having chickens in the city, which would certainly help. Right now, it costs more to have a chicken than it does to have a dog or cat, and that seems a little odd. Yeah. They also, there was rules about you have to have it for two years before you can eat it. You know, they weren't wanting to pay people to just get a free Eat the thing that's eating their food. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. This is Sturdivant. Um, I have like three questions. Uh, what year was this? Because it's being blocked by. Oh, sorry. It's fine. I just. Too many. Uh... I do. Okay. There's no good place to put it. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll need to wait for Jane's presentation, but has there been anything done on the demolition waste? I know that was brought up a few meetings ago. Yeah, um, our staff attended a regional meeting specifically focused at looking at demolition waste and interventions for it. It's a tricky category, as you can imagine, because unlike paper or um, glass, like demolition waste is a whole host of different things, right? Some of which can be recycled and some of which can be reused, a lot of which can't. Um, and I know that our staff is working really hard on that, but I don't know that they've made significant progress and part of that's just the challenging nature of that particular waste stream. Um, I do know that the city's policies for the properties that we own um, and I'm speaking about our housing properties specifically, is that when we go into demo, we pull everything out that could possibly be reused. Um, and we do that for two reasons. One, it's just good stewardship, but also so that we can be thinking through ourselves, like what are the ways to intervene in this? And you know, I will say the difficulty with this is the difficulty faced by any recycling program that so often we think, 
the ability to put it in a recycling bin is what makes it recyclable. When in fact, um, when you manage these programs, what you quickly realize is the ability to turn it into something else is what makes it recyclable, which is a way of saying the ability to have a contract with someone who says, yes, I will take your paper and cardboard and make new boxes out of it. Or in this case, I'll take your timber and I'll reuse it to something else. And those markets just don't seem to exist in quite the same way that they do for other recycling streams. So this is like one of the things that makes it particularly challenging. Uh, uh, this is Krieger, and I will say that um, from my experience, it changes drastically over the years too, because the sources for some of that have either gone away or some some cup pop up, new ones pop up. But it's it's an ever changing market, um, at least locally. I will say that one thing that might be interesting for the city to help maybe help um, provide would be templates for um, contractors that are uh, waste management plans mm -hmm. for them to utilize so that they can have um, you know something to work from rather than trying to generate it all new themselves because I know that that's been a barrier with the uh, contractors of different size that we've worked with in the past um, but uh, you know so that goes more to the, towards the education side to help enable it but again and it doesn't you know resolve the, the source issues but um, yeah I don't suppose you've developed those templates yeah well, we get them from other contractor partners, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have one question, um, just about the like paper and organics. Uh, I just know like right now I work in a, like, it's like a strip mall kind of thing and there's like a bunch of businesses and the only like trash things there is like trash and then cardboard only, which I feel like, it, and like we like right next to us is like two restaurants. So like they don't have a way of recycling their paper or getting rid of the organics without having to like have somebody travel across the city to go to a composting to drop it off. I mean, have you guys been like considering like, I don't know, having a more like increase, increasing like a pickup program for that stuff for businesses? We're actually not allowed as a city. We're legally prohibited from providing those services to commercial entities, which is why those programs look different than they do for residences. But um, I, I can say, and it helps no one, that you know we all experience quite a lot of heartburn over that. Um, but Jane does try to engage with businesses to make sure they're aware of those services. Um, they have to pay for them themselves. That's often the barrier, right? And so. Um, I know that Jane works really hard to try to line up, line up those resources as well as she can, but at the end of the day, it comes down to individual business choices. Um, but she is always looking for other opportunities. And I think one of the, I don't think I know, one of the motivations behind trying to expand our compost facility is that right now businesses tend not to, restaurants specifically, compost their organic waste because there's one small company um, that hauls it and they're at capacity as well. So you really don't have options, right? But if we build a sort of regional hub for composting, then places, um, businesses that may want to collect that material for businesses and bring it will have a place to bring it. And so the idea is if we build that, it might spur some business development. That's the theory. We hope we get the grant. We'll keep trying. Um, but it, yeah, I think that too is a long-term project. Do you know how much of organic waste that is still going to the landfill is from business versus residents? I don't. We can ask Jen and Jane. They may not know either. Whew, adaptation. All right, doing okay on time. <laughs> um, so the next couple of slides um, and the page in the report that are drawn from it are come from, I don't know that many of you were on the commission when this study took place, but we did in 2020 work with the Urban Drawdown Institute to um, do an initial, like very early stage carbon management study for the city, just to figure out basically where carbon was already being sequestered in the city and what our options might be to increase it. One of the things they did as part of that was create this LIDAR profile for the city. Um, LIDAR is laser technology. It's taken, uh, images are taken aerially um, down to, I believe, the square meter to show heat differentials. And what you see in this map 
is deviation in heat on a high heat day within Iowa City. So the red areas are areas that are hotter than the average temperature for that day, and the blue and green areas are areas that are cooler. Um, and it's not going to come as a big surprise when we go to the next slide to see that the blue and green areas are areas that have a lot of trees, and those uh, bright red areas correspond with sort of the white areas on the map here, which is really where we have um, very little tree cover. One of the things we think about a lot in our programming is not just how do we increase trees, which you all know about our wonderful Root for Trees program and all the efforts the city has been making to increase tree plantings in the right of way, but also there are just some areas of the city where planting trees is not going to cover it. If we look out this window, we can see we've got trees that just barely um, get up to the roof of City Hall. You know, a lot of our buildings downtown, it's not realistic necessarily that they're going to have tree cover to cover them. And so one of the tweaks we made to our TIF funded program this year was to start offering uh, incentives to paint roof white um, or to increase the reflective material on the roof so that some of these bright red areas, you know, we know we're going to have to address in other ways. And I know that we worked uh, very closely with Jamie on a heat survey um, in the last, well, by closely I mean they did all the work and we said thank you for the data, <laughs> no. um, about just looking at uh, energy burdened uh, residents in Iowa City and uh, what impacts that might have on their ability to uh, adapt to higher heat days that we know are coming as a result of climate change. And Jamie very kindly and her team, when we, uh, they gave us the results and we said, could you break this out by renters at all? Um, did actually do that. So you can see some of the data points, thanks Jamie, in this report come from the work that her office did, specifically that 6% uh, of Iowa City residents have no usable air conditioning, which you know, is unfortunate now, but could be deadly when in a future when we're facing 90 degree, uh, days a summer over 90 degrees, which is to say every day in the summer over 90 degrees, right? So something we want to be thinking about and addressing now. Um, and you'll also see um, from that survey, we got this wonderful um, talking point, well, not wonderful, but very useful talking point, that essentially one out of five Iowa City renters um, said that the cost of electricity is a barrier to using electricity or using air conditioning. So, and that was one of the things we were thinking about, not just who has it, but if you have it, you may not even be using it if energy costs are high for you, right? Which is another reason to increase the insulation in those homes. Sorry, Krieger again. So that brings me back maybe to the resilience hubs. Then are we talking also um, as having cooling centers? Like we may not have emergency shelters, but we may have a need for some of those other types of, of uh, assistance, I guess. Right. We, we do already have cooling centers in the city, um, and we do think about that. But um, again, circling back to the idea of sheltering in place, one of the reasons you see the discussion in... Uh, resilience hubs moving that way is just a recognition that it's very difficult to have enough cooling centers to account for the entire population of a city. Even if you do, a lot of people want to remain in their homes, if at all possible, because they have pets, or they have elderly family members, or they have medical devices that need um, an electric supply. So it's not just staying cool, they also need to be meeting these other needs. Um, so here too, right, it's an all of the above strategy. We want to be making sure that there are cooling centers within uh, walking distance of all residents of Iowa City, but we also want to be increasing insulation in homes and doing the things we can that are going to enable them to shelter in place if they want to. And actually, our resilience, um, uh, Climate Resilience Corps, one of the cool activities they did um, was learning how to build a DIY uh, air conditioning unit. Um, and then uh, the hope is that they will share that information going forward. Yeah. Cool. All right. Stormwater projects. We're, we're nearly there. We're going to make it. All right. Um, one of the key vulnerabilities here uh, that we identify and continue to think about is that um, just under a thousand Iowa City households continue to be in the floodplain. Um, half of those households have flood insurance or participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. And part of the reason for that is if you don't have a mortgage on your home, there is no requirement um, that you participate in flood insurance. And so a lot of people don't because it is 
expensive and uh, folks don't want to take it on. So that means in a devastating flood, potentially half of the people who are currently in the floodplain would not have their losses covered by insurance. Um, and this is one of, it's, I would argue it's actually the smaller of the reasons we have for getting people out of the floodplain, the larger one being it's just dangerous, right, to have people continue to be there. Um, one of the things I have been told by the city manager's office is that where we're at now, we have basically bought out all the properties we can buy out using federal dollars. And going forward, it is probably going to be city money that's applied to buy out those houses as they come available. We do have one, actually, um, that city council just in a recent meeting last month um, agreed to buy out and demolish, but um, that's going to be an ongoing process for us as well. I want to lead with that one on the slide before talking about the individual stormwater projects because clearly the higher priority for the city has to be getting residents out of the floodplain, right? It's, it's a human health, um, health and safety concern. Managing stormwater is also a health and safety concern, though, to a lesser degree, right? If your basement floods, it's not great, but it's not as devastating as losing your entire home. Um, we do, of course, have our ongoing program to uh, fund soil quality restoration, as well as, you know, we were distributing rain barrels and helping build raid gardens. Um, we, in the report, present the spending on that year over year. I actually asked Ben Clark, um, our engineer, as I was walking into this meeting, if he knew why spending was so much lower in 2021 compared to other years. He said he didn't know exactly, but that weather often has an impact that for soil quality restoration in particular, and Ben, you probably know more about this, not probably, you do know more about this than I do. If you, um, if you go in and treat the lawn and then you don't have the ideal weather following it, it can burn the lawn and then that gets folks upset. And he suspected that might have been part of the issue in 2021, but he has to go back and take a look at it to make sure. Um, and then we just uh, talk about some other insecurities that we've developed in the, or are keeping an eye on in the community, um, knowing that any vulnerability in the community that is currently existing is a climate vulnerability as well because climate change amplifies those vulnerabilities. So um, actually, it's just part of our CDP reporting. We keep track of the percent of the population that's food insecure. Um, and then we also think about in conjunction with that, um, the acres don't, uh, dedicated to community garden plots, um, which you can see is not large. And in some ways, I, I don't know, we found a really elegant way to talk about this. Like community gardens don't necessarily solve community hunger, right? Like here too, it's one intervention among many, but it's one that we have direct control over. So it's one we want to keep an eye on. Um, and you can see we also keep track of how many people are on the wait list each year to get a community garden plot and then how much money our division within Climate Action has spent on local foods initiatives. Um, actually, since 2016. It's the rare one that predates 2018 because that's when we started um, Farm to Street and that's one of our largest um, interventions actually in supporting the local food ecosystem. This is Sturvent. Um, can you go back? Yeah. Well, this kind of ties into the previous slide regarding the floodplain. What's the plan for houses that are demolished in that area? Is there anything? They're turned into green space. So the hope is that long term we'll be moving people out of the floodplain and we'll be creating um, green spaces that have larger holding capacity for the floodwaters that come to protect the surrounding structures Would just be beyond that. Would it do something like community gardens in some of those areas? You I know it'd be, have to be adapted, but... Yeah, you can. I would say they're probably not high priority locations, um, in part because in part because they have a tendency to flood and also just because they tend to be wetter ground, so gardens don't often do as well in floodplains as in other areas, but... That is a possibility. We can talk to our park staff. Cool. All right. Climate Resilience Corps, you know all about it. 
Um, actually, I'm kicking myself. I just realized I had meant to bring you the zine the students had made to share, and uh, I, I failed to do that today, so my apologies for that. But they do have the zine ready. They're getting ready to pack those kits, and when the weather gets nicer, they're going to be delivering them to their neighborhoods. Um, the youth that we've worked with through this program have continued to be very enthusiastic about it, um, even uh, reaching out to our office periodically for more information, and um, they're putting together now an Earth Day event, and they wanted to bring ASTIG planning in to participate in it because they were so impressed with the things they learned. And you can see this little top picture is actually them making the DIY uh, air conditioning units that we were talking about. And I have to say, hats off to ASTIG in the planning committee uh, meeting. We were talking about how it uses uh, styrofoam coolers. I don't know how ASTIG did it, but they actually found coolers made from recycled material. So our qualms about styrofoam were addressed, which we appreciated. Um, and then we just have some pages dedicated in the report to how we are getting the message out about all of this. Because, you know, as you know, one of the other things we often talk about, um, both here and elsewhere, is that only 5% of the emissions in the city are directly under the control of City Hall. That means 95% of the emissions have to be addressed by the actions of individual households and businesses and community groups. And so how we communicate with them is critical. You can see we did um, the same kind of audit, actually, that we had done looking at the climate action grants. We wanted to see how our messaging was lining up compared to the big action areas. And you can see it looks a little different, but um, thank, thank heavens, buildings and energy squeaks out a win and ends up being the largest area that we're messaging about, um, followed by general climate action. So it's not going to line up entirely with the pie chart um, of emissions impacts, but partly that's because that pie chart doesn't talk about climate change in general, and that is something we have to talk about in our own messaging. But um, on the whole, it was actually, I was quite pleased to see how balanced that coverage has been. It's been a goal of ours. If we look back to previous years, there too, not quite as balanced as it is now. And we continue to get more subscribers to our uh, sustainability newsletter, which is also really nice because Diane does a great job putting it together. I won't go into Goldie. You know all about Goldie really cool. It's been, had a great impact. Um, we actually continue to hear anecdotally about some of the impacts. Um, in the last newsletter, we rolled out our next campaign, which is local water equals local food as a way of encouraging people, hopefully, to bring the same kind of enthusiasm they have for local foods to the water that comes out of the tap um, and try to make some of those climate benefits uh, for both more explicit. Um, the day after the newsletter went out, um, Diane reported walking down the street and there was a group of neighbors talking about like, isn't it so great that the tap water here in Iowa City is less than a penny a gallon? So we know that some people are paying attention, um, which is great. And then I will pause and ask City Council for questions, which you all have been so great about asking me throughout. So um, is there anything we didn't touch on that I know there are some things that are in the report that aren't quite in the slide deck yet and I'm happy to go into them if we didn't hit on them for you. This is Gade, and I just want to say that going through this and being new, too, to the commission was just a really great overview of everything you've been doing, all the efforts in the last few years. Um, the data was just really great. Everything you've collected was just, it's great that you keep an eye on all of those things. Um, so yeah, it was really easy to read, too, and understand. It was just, it was great. So I applaud you for your work in, in this report and just in general. <laughs> oh, thank you. A lot of that credit, I will say, goes, um, I, we all worked on it as a division to pull it together. This is uh, an effort that took us several months to get complete, but a lot of the layout and design and the really thoughtful approach to it, that credit goes to Diane Platt, which I'm saying now because she also helps transcribe our minutes, so she'll know that <laughs> we gave credit where credit was due. Thanks, Diane. Did you identify yourself so she knows that was you that said that? <laughs> Should we go to the recap? Sounds good. Um, our next meeting is going to be again in this room on Monday, April 3rd, uh, same time, 3.30 to 5 p.m. And for actionable items, um, I'm going to send the link to the Resilience Hub resources that we've been looking at in the working group to the commission as a whole, so you all can check that out. 
And then um, Danny is going to follow up with our uh, volunteers for the uh, climate action grants to get a meeting set to review those applications when they come in and also um, ahead of that he'll be sharing social media posts developed by our communication staff with the Commission as a whole so that you all can be posting them to your individual feeds as well and confirming next meeting is Monday April 3rd I have a motion to adjourn. Krieger, I move to adjourn. <laughs> Gade, I second. Y'all want to adjourn? Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs>